So when we study the representation theory of SU3, or equivalently of the complexification of its Lie algebra, which is little sl3c, one of the key pictures we drew was the weight diagram for the adjoint representation, which we call the root diagram. It's so important it's got a special name, the root diagram. So in that case, there was this hexagonal picture with six non-zero weights, or roots, L, I minus L, J, and the corresponding weight space, which I'm gonna call little g, L, I minus L, J, was one dimensional and it was spanned by this matrix E, I, J, which had a one in position I, J and zeros elsewhere. Then over zero, the zero weight space was uh, basically spanned by the matrices H13 and H23. In other words, it was the diagonal matrices uh, theta1, theta2, minus theta1, minus theta2. Okay, so that was what we had in this example. Now, there was this nice thing that if we picked one of these non-zero weights, as in one of the weights that occurs in the root diagram, and we pick the opposite weight, then, well, for a start, these weight spaces are one-dimensional. We can pick a spanning vector from each of them, let's say E13 and E31. We can take the commutator bracket and get, in this case, in this case H13, in the zero weight space. And together those three guys generated an SL2C subalgebra of SL3C. So E, um, IJ, EJI, and HIJ span an SL2C subalgebra. In other words, a Lie subalgebra isomorphic to SL2C. And then Everything we studied about the um, weight diagrams of SL3 representations used this fact, right? This gave us the vial symmetry. It told us that this whole picture has to be symmetric about this line. It's a reflection symmetry in this line, orthogonal to the line connecting these three dots. Uh, and it was that that gave us the fact that all our weight diagrams were hexagonal or triangular, that kind of thing. So this is a really key thing, and this is one, one thing that will generalize to all uh, semi-simple Lie algebras of compact groups. So that's what we're going to try and prove today. So here we go. Uh, let's suppose I've got a compact group, which I'm going to call K. Um, and it's Lie algebra I'm going to call little k. And then I'm going to reserve little g for the complexification of this Lie algebra, just because we're almost always going to be using little g, and that's the letter we're familiar with. So I don't want to have to write g tends to c everywhere. Inside my compact group K, I have a maximal torus. Its Lie algebra I was calling little t and the complexification of that I'm call, calling little h. The adjoint representation of k is a map from k to uh, gl of little k um, that sends uh, little g to add g, where add g of x equals gx, g inverse. Now, I want this to be a complex representation. Currently, it's not because little k is just a real Lie algebra. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to let x be taken with complex coefficients. So I get a representation from k to gl of the complexification, little g. And of course, I get the corresponding map on Lie algebras, little add from little k to gl of little g and the complexification of that, which goes from little g to, sorry, that's a little gl, to 
a little gl of little g. Okay, so this is my adjoint representation. This is the thing I want to decompose into weight spaces for the maximal torus. So because we have a maximal torus, we get a weight decomposition. Little g splits as a sum of weight spaces. So instead of calling these weight spaces w lambda or w something, I'm going to call them little g alpha. So the little g alphas are the weight spaces. They are the set of x's in little g such that add h of x equals alpha of h x for all h in little h. Okay, so this direct sum of g alphas is happening over some finite set of weights. So which weights occur? Well, zero occurs. Alpha equals zero occurs. In other words, there are weight vectors with weight zero because little h is an abelian Lie algebra, it's the Lie algebra of a maximal torus. So add h of h prime equals zero for all h and h prime in little h. So this tells us that little h is a subset of the zero weight space of our Lie algebra. So just like in this picture above, the zero weight space here contains h13, it contains h23. All of the h's live in the zero weight space. Now, in fact, um, lemma one, h equals little g zero. In other words, those are the only weight vectors with weight zero, just like in our other um, example. And this is basically because h is a, the Lie algebra of a maximal torus, or the complexification thereof. So here's the proof. Suppose z is in little g zero. In other words, z is in little g, it's an element of the complexified Lie algebra, and add h z equals zero for all h in little h. Well, add h z equals zero, that's the same as saying h bracket z equals zero. So that's saying z commutes with all these h's. In particular, h bracket z equals zero for all h in t, the algebra of the maximal torus, because that's a subset of little h. So here's a picture. I'm actually going to get more space because uh, I'm running out of space. Here's a picture of our complexified Lie algebra. This is k, the Lie algebra of the group. This is i, k, and altogether this picture is of little g. So z is some point in this complexified Lie algebra. And you can see it has a real part and an imaginary part. So z equals x plus i, y for some um, x and y in little k. Okay, but if h bracket z equals zero, that's h brackets x plus i h bracket y, and this is for h in the Lie algebra of little t. Um, so if that's supposed to be zero, the real imaginary parts both have to vanish. So that's saying h brackets x equals h brackets y equals zero. So x and y in the Lie, algebra, the Lie algebra of the group commute with all elements of the Lie algebra of the maximal torus. So if x and t, uh, sorry, x and y, if either of them um, are not contained in little t, then the so little t plus the span of x, in other words, the vector space you get by adding x to little t, or little t plus 
the span of y, one of those two will be a bigger abelian subalgebra than little t. And it will contain little t. But little t, you know, is supposed to be the Lie algebra of a maximal torus. Um, so if we give this bigger thing a name, maybe t prime, then exp of t prime closure is a bigger maximal torus. And that's a contradiction because we're already supposed to have a maximal torus. We can't get any bigger than that. Okay, so. Our zero weight space is really just this little h, exactly like in this example here. Okay, so we we're asking which weights occur. Well, zero occurs. Any other weight that occurs is called a root. So the non zero weights of the adjoint representation are called roots. The weight diagram is called a root diagram. Every time I say the word weight in this context, I should probably have said root. Okay, so here's the next lemma. Oh, I should say, uh, we'll write R for the set of roots. So here's the next lemma. Uh, there's various parts to this. So first part, if x is in little g alpha, this root space, and y is in little g beta, another root space, then x bracket y is in uh, little g alpha plus beta. I won't prove this. This is an exercise. This is very similar to the thing we proved for SU3 that said, you know, EIJ, or let's say E12 moves things in the L1 minus L2 direction. So this is an exercise. This is analogous to for SL2. C, this is analogous to saying X moves things to the right. It's telling us if we have a weight vector and we act using the adjoint representation, where does that move another weight vector to? So in this diagram for SL3C, it was the the thing that told us, you know, E13 moves everything along these arrows, etc. Okay, that's part one of the lemma. B, um, again, if x is in little g alpha and y is in little g beta, then the killing form uh, of x and y is zero unless alpha plus beta equals zero. We'll prove that in a second. And first, let's see a consequence of this. If uh, little g is semi-simple, then alpha is a root if and only if minus alpha is a root. Okay, so let's prove B and C. Okay, proof of B. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a basis of little g consisting of weight vectors. In other words, I can do this uh, because um, little g splits as a direct sum of weight spaces. I just pick a basis of each weight space and that gives me a basis of little g consisting of weight vectors. Um, so suppose z is one of these guys and it lives in the weight space g gamma. Where does that guy go under the map add x add y? Remember, if I want to compute kxy, I need to compute this matrix with respect to some basis and then take the trace. Well, add x, add y of z lives in little g 
of alpha plus beta plus gamma because it's equal to x bracket y bracket z and by part a of the lemma you know when I bracket with y I change the weight by beta if I bracket with x I change it by alpha so if I start in weight gamma I end up in weight alpha plus beta plus gamma so let's write this as a block matrix um, so this is maybe uh, weight lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, etc. And the ijth block of this matrix is looking at where, you know, the, the components of g lambda i that get sent to g lambda j. So the diagonal blocks are when g lambda goes to g lambda, but if alpha plus beta is not zero, then you know g gamma goes to g gamma plus alpha plus beta and that's never equal to gamma because alpha, be alpha plus beta is not zero so there are no diagonal blocks in this matrix and that tells us the trace is zero right if there's nothing on the diagonal then the trace is zero so if alpha plus beta is not zero then the trace is zero so k x y is zero. Okay, what about part C? If G is semi-simple, then alpha is a root if and only if minus alpha is a root. Um, well, if G is semi-simple, then what that means is the killing form is non-degenerate. So for all x, there exists a y such that, sorry, for all non-zero x, there exists a y such that kxy is non-zero for the killing form. So if x is in g alpha and is non-zero, then you know there exists a y such that uh, kxy is non-zero. So let's expand y with respect to a basis of weight vectors. So, in other words, let's just take the components of y in the various weight spaces. Uh, so y is a sum over weight spaces of y lambda. A lambda is the sort of component of y in the lambda weight space. Um, well then, k x y lambda is zero unless lambda equals minus alpha. So that tells us that the y minus alpha component has to be non-zero. And that tells us that g minus alpha is not zero. And that tells us that minus alpha is a root. So it's if and only if because you could apply the same argument to minus alpha and then you get that alpha was a root. Okay, so that explains in this picture why every point has an opposite point. Right, every vertex of the hexagon has an opposite vertex, also in the hexagon. So the trick for extracting these SL2C subalgebras will be the following, which I'll state now and I'll prove next time. So here's the theorem. If x is in g alpha and y is in g minus alpha, then x, y and x bracket y Form, uh, I should say they're non-zero, then they form a subalgebra of G isomorphic to little sl 2c. And that's exactly what we did in this example. We picked a non-zero weight vector for weight L1 minus L3, a non-zero weight vector for L3 minus L1. We took the Lie bracket to get H13, and that gave us a Lie subalgebra isomorphic to SL2C. And that's always going to work. That's what we're going to prove next.